Hello and welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. On today's episode, I had the opportunity to chat with Ed Solomon, screenwriter of No Sudden Move. Directed by Steven Soderbergh and with a killer cast including Don Cheadle, Benicio Del Toro, and David Harbour, the film is set in 1950s Detroit and follows a group of criminals brought together under mysterious circumstances that have to work together to uncover what's really going on when their simple job goes completely sideways. You said a man wants to see me. Ali Albert. Can't come in. What is he, white? So what's the score? We're sending a man that works in an office to pick something up. You are part of a babysitting team watching his family while he does it. Good morning. Everything is normal. Except... What do you want? Is that something you'd say? Normal Monday? I'm gonna shoot you right now. Can I go home now? Wait at the house after. What do you mean after? But right off of you. What is going on? What's going on, big guy? Yeah, what are we doing? We're following instructions. Are you helping me or are you not helping me? No, 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 no. No, no, no. Thank you. Set up, man. God called me, offering me $10,000 to turn you in. 15 for the white guy. Think you're the only one that can make a move? I can make a move, too. I have the keys. I'd like to listen to the radio. Ed and I discuss the way the film balances theme and character, his writing process, and a whole lot more. And of course, we touched on the Bill and Ted movies. This is a good one. Check it out. Ed Solomon, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. For someone who hasn't had a chance to see the trailer or or heard about the the movie yet, uh, how would you describe No Sudden Move? I would describe No Sudden Move as a 50s style noir set in Detroit, set against the backdrop of a sort of changing racial and urban landscape. Two low level criminals kind of carving their way up the echelons Mm -hmm. in a kind of heist that goes drastically bad. (laughs) <laughs> that is certain. Uh, that is definitely one way of putting it. With a, 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 a script like this, with a movie like this, with you know a really sprawling cast of characters, an intricate plot with double, triple crosses, things like that. Where do you start? How do you you know what what, what what kind of outlining? What kind of you know before you ever start putting pen to you know that paper? What how do you get all of that together? The first thing for me is always trying to figure out what is the essential nature of the movie and what is the I hate this word sometimes because it sounds kind of pretentious. What is the itness of it? What is it trying to be? And specifically with regard to this one, originally Stephen and I were going to do a bigger heist movie that took place all around the country. We started talking about it, breaking it down. And then we were kind of like, you know what? Actually, let's like narrow the scope of this. Let's make it much more streamlined and linear. Let's set it just in Detroit. Let's make it just, we reduce the amount of characters uh, let's just make it three characters, initially three characters. And I I went from having to think of it as this big heist and what are the needs of a big heist movie with more characters and a lot of landscape to what is this small version of the noir movie? And it wasn't until I realized it is at the end of the day about the dynamic between Don Cheadle's character and Benicio Del Toro's character. Once I realized, oh, that's what it's about, then I knew that it had its structure kind of almost implicit within it. It was going to be this back and forth cat and mouse with all these different double crosses. Then we started talking specifically about, well, what, what, what's the tone? I was asking Steven a lot, you know, what's like a, a a style of film that I should watch. Cause a lot of times when he and I work on stuff, he'll say, watch these six movies. Mm -hmm. And I always love that because then you get into a kind of mindset and so we watched, or I should say, I watched, uh, you know, Point Blank at Carter with Fifi, probably six or seven films like in this style. Originally, I was thinking more like 70s style, but set in the 50s. And then it sort of moved to like more like Douglas Sirk kind of feeling. And um, we started in two ways. One was he actually wrote some random dialogue for like randomly placed, like, like, not like this is going anywhere or put this in, but more like, this is the feel that I'm going for. Like little bits, you know, like three lines here, five lines there. 
that was great for me. I love that. I love having these rules given to you. We're going to be in this style. This is going to be the kind of lexicon we're using, you know? Mm-hmm. And then we started throwing around together some basic story beats. And then I went off and kind of did my thing for a while and came up with a fairly rough shape outline, talked to him about it, got the thumbs up, went away and just went, did, did a beat sheet. And in this one, I wrote very differently than I usually write. This one I wrote from the beat sheet and not in order, which is unusual for me. I just kind of fleshed scenes out as they came forward. And then I would, you know, go back and revise a scene. And it was really interesting way to write. Kind of opened me up a lot in, in a certain way because it also, it freed me. And it wrote faster that way because usually, uh, you know, like I've been one of those writers that often can't get to page 46 without having one to 45 feeling perfect. And I have found that that way of thinking has actually slowed me down. And this opened me up in a way. It's nice. It's, it's nice having been doing it for a long time to constantly have these challenges that break your habits. And was the the period and this uh, and the location, the Detroit location, always part of the idea? Because especially as the story goes on, it becomes clearer and clearer that this story could really only be told at this time in Detroit. How when did that become part of the of the project? When we began initially, as I was saying, you know, it was kind of more sprawling, and then we went, let's just do this in Detroit, and let's do it in this time period, and then I started doing reading about. Detroit in this time period. And I was looking for something that they could be stealing. That's when the mm-hmm. notion of what the MacGuffin turns out to be came up in my mind. I'll, I'll leave that out as to not sure. do a spoiler. But once I realized that, and I realized, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, but I don't think it really will hurt anything, which is once I also thought, you know what, I don't want it to be that they're stealing something that people are trying to make. I want it to be much more interesting. I think if they're stealing something that people are trying to hide, and if that's the case, what would that be? And then I went, oh, got it. I know what this is. I had, you know, was doing research and had some people doing research for me. My, my good friend, Laura Shapiro, who works with me sometimes, and uh, she came up with this. She's like presented a bunch of different possibilities. And I was like, ooh, that one. And yeah. then once we had that, I was reading about, okay, who would these people be? And we knew that Don was going to be in it. And we knew it would be like three people initially. So I was thinking, what would be a really interesting backdrop for that, for Dawn? Mm-hmm. And I started reading about the destruction of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, which were thriving African-American residents, residential and commercial neighborhoods that got completely bulldozed when they decided to put the freeways into Detroit. And in the kind of freewayization, so to speak, of America, which was really starting in that period, I thought, well, that's really an interesting backdrop. Then I was reading, I was just reading online of, you know, as much as I could. And I saw, oh my God, in Detroit, there's, we're in the last two days of an exhibit at the Detroit Public Library, which was called uh, Black Bottom Street View, I believe, by a woman named Emily uh, Kutil, K-U-T-I-L. She had put this project together where these photographs had been taken of the Black Bottom and Paradise Valley areas by the city. They literally were driving by taking photographs, almost like the Google car does now, but it was (laughs) these black and white photos. They just went basically like block to block to block, taking photos of everything. The people of the neighborhoods all thought it was, the photos were being taken to basically memorialize them. They actually were proud of the photos that were being taken, but what they didn't realize was that they were being taken because they were going to be destroying it all. And that exhibit, which was something you could walk through, she had taken the exhibit and blown up. I mean, she had taken the photos, excuse me, and blown them up so that you could walk in the Detroit Public Library as though you were walking through these neighborhoods. So I was like, okay, I got to get on a plane. I just got on a plane and flew to Detroit. And um, in the process was looking at a there was a website that a guy named Jamon Jordan ran uh, called, uh, it was called Black Squirrel Network. And it was about African-American Detroit history. So I contacted him and I was like, hey, can I meet you? And he was finishing a, a tour. He does these walking tours at the same place I was going. So I met him and he oh, walked wow. around. It was fantastic. And he's actually in the movie. You can see him. He's in the movie. Coincidentally, under my screen credit is Jamon. 
that he's asleep <laughs> in the window in the barbershop. So just, just to say that that's the guy. He was great. He became our consultant on the film, um, you know, historical consultant. And so, you know, he vetted all the script stuff for me. And um, yeah, so that's how it kind of emerged. And, you know, obviously it sounds like you did a, a ton of research and, you know, had some really surprise uh, resources available to you that you weren't anticipating. How much of that, you know, because, you know, the movie does a really great job. And I feel like Stevens movies do this in general. They're about these bigger subjects, but they're all it's also a really entertaining crime movie with this, you know, ridiculous cast of characters. How do you find that balance on the page, you know, between all of this historical context and just, you know, uh, an Elmore Leonard style pulp crime thing? That's a great question. I think the key for us always was let's make it entertaining and fun and let's err on the side of that we're not trying to you know preach or give you medicine you have to take but I always like the stories that have a little bit more of a social background to them just whether it's you know Chinatown or LA Confidential or things that just have a little bit of now Chinatown has a huge bit of it we, we don't have as much Chinatown and Lord knows I would never want to compare myself to Chinatown in any <laughs> Ever. That's a really, this is where you should like reach through the screen and throttle me. <laughs> but as aspirational, you know, movies, I always like stuff that just has a little bit more oomph to it. It also just, it gave the character, it gave Don's char character in particular something to be that I thought was interesting, like to be angry about. He had a more of a personal stake in it. And because this film was traversing a bunch of, you know, the landscape of Detroit and a lot of the kind of, as I said, the echelons, you know, uh, of power in Detroit, it felt like that was a natural backdrop for it, you know, because what is power about? And if it's these little guys up against these sort of powerful people, what's the source of their power? And, you know, and if it was based in real history, it made it less arch in my mind. It made it more real and it gave them a little more moral authority, I thought. So yeah. that's why. And, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, the sort of different echelons of society at the time and the movie, even at a certain point, there's a character in the movie, I won't spoil it, but it starts talking about caste versus class. It seems like basically to, down to each and every character and relationship, the, the, those, two, the, those two competing things play into it somehow. And I'm just curious, you know, how conscious of, of, uh, are you of that? Or is that something that just, you know, as you're writing it, when you're, um, if you've planned it out well enough, it kind of just falls into place. So another great question. Hopefully they work in tandem. You're, you're, you're both plotting and thinking about what is it about and who are these people and what is the backdrop and the themes are emerging out of that. And as the themes emerge, more character ideas come in. I try to look at them all as holistically as possible. The character, and thank you for not doing the spoiler on that, because there are people who have <laughs> spoiled that. People are like, why did you do that? There was a surprise guest in the movie. I'll just say that. That was daunting. My God, Stephen was like, uh, okay, I want to I want, like, let's do a scene and talk about comparing yourself to movies. I don't even want to say. I know where like, you're going with this, though. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Doing a scene like this other movie with that that's written by that amazing writer. Like, you've got to be kidding me. It took almost as long to think about what that scene was, it was as it was to outline the whole movie in a certain way. And it was exceedingly daunting for me to, to think about that. But I had to go, dude. You know, <laughs> you've been doing this a long time. It's like, I guess it's sort of like being in the NBA. You've got to like get up to that free throw line with 1.2 seconds left when you're down by two and make two shots. Yeah. I guess I better freaking do it. <laughs> yeah. The idea of, you know, class, no cast. That was a theme I had been working on because in my mind, it was really a the dynamic between Don's character and Benicio's character was that Benicio was on this descent and there's a line that this actor that you're talking about gives at the very end, two people who from entirely different directions, you know, came together or mm -hmm. actually that's not exactly the line, but you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was just, I really loved the idea of Benicio's character having started at one point as a real like high draft prospect for mm -hmm. General Motors or Ford, you know, and he got, he took this job at General Motors and had this big career and just, has been on the descent, even when he got into crime, he had high aspirations for where he'd be and he's just been kind of sinking. Mm -hmm. And I liked the idea that you can drop through that way, but you can't 
break through the top. And so the fact that Don and Benicio end up where they end up in that scene, which is such a surprise to this character who's kind of up at the top echelon, I always knew it had end up there, but I didn't know that that specific speech would come out until I was just trying to write it. Well, it's really, I mean, it's really, the way it sort of ties everything together is wonderful. And yeah, I mean, without naming names or uh, going to the comparison you were going to say, I think it it, it really, it stands uh, among uh, those types of scenes in terms of its effectiveness and how it alters the sort of course of the rest of the movie. Okay, dude, I'm going to stop now and <laughs> stop doing all interviews and <laughs> retire on that. Thank you for saying that. There is an homage. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, there's a little Easter egg homage to the thing you're talking about. <laughs> it comes toward the end of the movie. It's on a piece of glass. <laughs> Leave it at that. And if anybody check can find it. Uh, I think my screen is still available, so I'm going to have to check that out after I get off of you. <laughs> yeah, see if you can um, tell. If, if, if anyone who's listening to this can, can figure out what it is, send out a tweet and yeah. uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> you you know you mentioned you call me after or something let me know if okay, you see yeah, I will. <laughs> it's um, toward the end so you don't have to watch the whole thing Just I mean, i'm gonna watch the whole thing again anyway because by the end of it i was like well now that i know what's going on i'd like to go back and see what's <laughs> going on <laughs> you mentioned you know uh how close your collaboration was with steven soderbergh on this one and you know you worked with him on mosaic which was a, you know, also a really interesting sort of project. And I'm just curious, how, you know, for you as a writer, when you're working that closely with someone, does your process is your process different than when you're just working on, you know, uh, in a siloed off by yourself? Another great question, man. It's seriously, yes, the process is very different when you're working with a director, when you're working with an actor in mind, when you're working with, or just when you're working on your own. Part of the reason, of course, is. By the way, it's always better working with the person that you know is going to ultimately realize it. It's better for so many reasons, including you're buffered from having to do a series of passes for people that ultimately aren't really going to be making any choices. Not that I don't like that. I, you know, Often those people really help the script. But in the case of this versus, let's say, this project I just completed that has no director and no cast attached, um, on that one, you know, I'm working with development executives and people, but ultimately that script is gonna get into the hands of someone who's gonna be making bigger decisions. And then you're gonna go through that process again. Working with someone like Steven or Steven specifically, and especially Steven because he really knows the kinds of things he wants and doesn't want and that he's trusted by the studio. Mm -hmm. So working with him, you actually know where it's gonna end up. I already know the tone. I know what the look is gonna be. I've already writing with that DNA in place, which is huge. Then when you know an actor, like we had Don, we knew it was going to be Don. Uh, initially, there were some other people we had discussed. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it was, it was in the press. There were a few actors that were named. There was Josh Brolin was going to play the part for a brief period at the, at the rap, or not the rap party, the, the party after the premiere the other night at Tribeca, mm. the Tribeca Film Festival. Amy and Benicia were doing a selfie to send to Josh Brolin, who's working on the TV show that Amy's doing, to basically go, <laughs> look, I'm here not. I mean, joking. They were really, yeah. <laughs> Josh was like, how was it? <laughs> Apparently, I wasn't involved. I didn't know Josh. I had never met him. So I didn't, I don't know, but I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> but writing with the actor in mind also can be really freeing. I mean, people often think that these impediments or that these rules you place are impediments. They're actually, I find rules for the most part to be very freeing they open you up so this is the tone this is the style this is the lexicon so to speak you know this is the it's almost like the key signature that you know you're writing and this is the tempo and this is the chord progressions we want to use i love that you know i would love trying you know trying to make my own story out of like if you said okay and i'm definitely not going to do it here because i have not had enough sleep (laughs) if you said you know Look, we have this actor and we and we want to set it in this location in this time period. And we had, you know, and you got to use these 19 words or, you know, I'd be like, awesome. What a great challenge. And how do I make those words feel fresh and a part of this and also be my own? I love that stuff. And it reminds me of fiction classes that I took from a wonderful writing teacher named Kathy Coleman in Los Angeles. I, I, I don't know if she's still teaching. She might be. They're just fiction classes. And we would do these exercises at the beginning of class. So the first half was writing exercises. And the second half was reading the work you'd prepared. And inevitably, I thought everyone's work, my own included, 
was best in the exercise was the exercises created better work than the stuff we forced ourselves we had a full week to think about and sometimes that was the case because the exercises were designed to break your patterns of thinking Mm -hmm. or give you certain rules that force you to come up with creative reasons to make certain decisions and when you have to justify certain decisions for certain reasons it forces you to sometimes get deeper than you would think you would think it would make things more shallow it's actually the opposite it's it's why I think, and now I'm going to say a very writer centric thing. It's why a lot of times in theater and in television now, the performances are more interesting than in film. I'm not saying it in this case. I think the actors in this movie, God, were wonderful. And I'm unbelievably grateful to them. I can't even tell you because, of course, as you know, good acting makes your script seem better. And I really (laughs) like, thank you, you guys. Thank you. When you actually are forced as you are in television or in theater to figure out and interpret what the words are and why they're there. Sometimes the choices are much more interesting than what often happens in film, which is something doesn't make sense to an actor and rather than go, why is this here? How can I make an interesting choice to justify it? They go, it doesn't feel right. Change it. Or if a director doesn't quite understand something, change it or they just change it on the fly for you rather than take a beat or two and go, wait, why is that there? How can I make that work? And then of course, you know, if it doesn't work, we rewrite. I mean, I'm on set every day rewriting as the movie is moving. So the movie is always moving, but I think being forced to work within a regimen actually often makes for more interesting material. Uh, You mentioned, you know, uh, fiction classes that, uh, or that you took, I'm just taking a giant step back. When was the, you know, your first inclination that you might want to be a storyteller, that you might want to be a writer? I remember a moment. I must have been three. I was I was a somewhat depressive kid. I still am a somewhat depressive kid. Um, <laughs> and I remember, although I wouldn't consider myself a depressed person, but I would like I, I tended to go inside my I was both an introvert and an extrovert kind of at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling truly down as a very young child. And I, I had to have been in the three to four range because of where I was. And I remember sitting in the closet downstairs in the playroom. And I remember having an image as though the closet itself was a chimney going all the way up. And I had an image of fictional characters dropping down through that chimney. And I remember this moment of saying to myself, if I ever feel lonely, this is what's going to keep me company where these fantastical characters, these imaginary figures dropping somehow out of the sky. And I remembered that moment not long ago because as with most of us, I, you know, I'm an imposter. Like we, you know, we all feel like well, they're going to figure me out at one point. I have to keep working hard because I don't trust that I know what I'm doing. And at one point they're going to figure out, I don't know what I'm doing and I got to try harder and I got to work harder. And I was thinking about that because I was thinking, I never felt like a real writer. I still don't feel like a writer. But then I was like, dude, you were thinking that way back then. You Mm -hmm. were thinking that, remember that? And then I thought, yeah, that's right. And then in fifth grade, I remember at camp, I wanted to write sketches. And then I remember in middle school, junior high, I was writing skits and performing in them. And then I remembered in high school, I wanted to write, but I always thought I wanted to write because all my friends had other real talent. And that was the only thing no one else did. I don't think I was giving myself enough credit. And I'll say one last thing about that. I actually think even if I don't believe that, like, I think I believe it, that I'm not really a writer. I actually feel it. But I also think that it's important for me to maintain that stance on a tactical level which I would call more of the beginner's mind stance, which is at the beginning of every project, it's like, what is this? <laughs> and I, I truly go through a process of not just saying, how does this want to be written, but how do you write? Like, how do you write anything? How does anyone <laughs> write? How did I do that last thing? I don't understand. So that I, it's almost like you're learning it with each project. You're learning how to write, not just this project, but how to write. Mm-hmm. And I have found that that's helped me because as you probably are aware, I don't know if other folks that you've interviewed have talked 
about screenwriting career is traditionally a pretty short one. According to the Writers Guild, I remember Chuck Slocum, who was the numbers cruncher for the Writers Guild. Maybe he's still there. I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a few years. I remember him saying the median length of a screenwriter's career is eight years. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, okay. I don't want that to be the case. How do I stay writing? And, and the only way to stay writing, I think, is combination of reinvention, but like real reinvention. Like how do you, how do you reinvent some, yourself in a way that keeps you in, in your wheelhouse, but not, but just outside your comfort zone. So you're constantly pushing, constantly pushing, but, but pushing in ways that mostly you can succeed in, or at least fail in. And I have failed spectacularly in many things in writing <laughs> scripts that have not worked or movies that have been terrible that are my fault, or sometimes they're terrible because it's partly my fault or not my fault, but like <laughs> I'm often a lot to blame. And how do you make those failures work for you? Meaning how do you take those bad experiences both creatively, like this isn't working or professionally like critics hated this or the thing bombed and nobody went to see it whatever how do you take that and not get cynical not get bitter not get jealous of the or envious of the folks who aren't having those experiences or how do you use that envy or jealousy to make your work better for yourself how do you metabolize something that went wrong and then grow from it and that's all been a real a real tricky thing to navigate because it's really hard. And when I look at the majority of my career, I think it's, it's probably more failure than success. And I, and when I really look at what led to the successes, I can point to the so-called failures at each time, including no sudden move. I can trace it back. Well, if it wasn't for mosaic, which wasn't a failure, by any stretch, I, I was proud of Mosaic, but it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been doing No Sudden Move, but I wouldn't have been doing uh, Mosaic had it not been for the fact that I had maintained a relationship with Casey Silver, who I'd met 30 years ago on a movie that was an utter failure. A script that I was proud of, the movie didn't work, and, but I was always really grateful to Casey and really appreciative of the fact that he had taken a chance on it and I always felt like I owed him one. Mm -hmm. And he was chairman of Universal at the time. And so I've never really been friends with studio heads when they're the heads of a studio. I think it's a tilted relationship. They want something from you or you want something from them. I don't trust it. I prefer to not have those kinds of relationships. But when Casey left Universal, we started hanging out as friends, having lunch, we lived somewhat close to each other every once in a while talking, you know, not about work, really just about our lives and our kids. And I always thought when the time is right, I want to make it up to him. And in 2013, he's like, Hey, have this weird little 10 minute thing. Would you be interested? <laughs> like, sure. And I guess they were having trouble finding like a person to do it or something. And I was like, this is my chance. And then it turned out to be this thing with Steven. And I was like, I'm going to do everything I can to make this work, you know? And that, that's sort of what led to this in a way. And I look at all my things, one or another, anything that's worked out is usually the result of me having made a giant mistake that led me into this <laughs> next direction to the thing that made it work out. So at the end of the day, I think it's more about a mindset. Uh -huh. And I think if you can understand failure as actually just a doorway and and an inevitable part of the process. And if you can also understand that most of our job is failing, like, I mean, on a daily basis, we're failing, you know, we're, we're not getting the scene, right. We're not getting the, the movie's not ready. You've written a draft and it's not ready. I can't quite solve it yet. You know, I mean, this thing you see behind me is this outline to this other, this is the branching narrative version of the next thing Stephen and I are doing together. We're doing a thing that has a branching narrative as well as a linear structure to it it's been designed to be both mm -hmm. and you know every day it's like i've solved a little bit 
yeah. but most of it I haven't yet. And then I've solved a little bit more and now I got to go back and, you know, it's, it's constantly a sense of failure and that can really be demoralizing as a writer for any of us, unless you both, you learn how to both have a relationship with that failure as well as patience and not view success as finishing, but you view success as getting meaning from the process, mm -hmm. not even joy, meaning or purpose, you know, like, okay, this is hard. Okay. This isn't finished. Okay. This is isolating. Okay. This is, you know, confusing. And there's always that moment. And this is where having done it for a while helps. There's always that moment in the script and it's happened in every script. It happened on this one. It happened on No Sudden Move where I almost had felt like calling Stephen and saying, I don't think I can, get it. I can do it. Like, I didn't know what the story was. It was before I had that realization that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is what the movie is. And when you don't know, or when I don't know, my whole body reacts. Like, it's, re it's almost like I can't stay awake. You know, something's not working. I can't get myself to understand it. And I go through all these feelings of, I don't think I even know how to write. Oh, it's finally happened. It's, it's been revealed. And then I have to say to myself, oh, you're in that phase of this. Yeah. Remember you're in that phase of this last time and the time before. So all part of a continuum. Yeah. You know, so once you kind of, you know, you, you got to that point where, you know, over the years you, you're writing sketches, you know, this is the thing that, you know, you can kind of have, feel a connection to. How do you, what were the, what practical steps do you then take to say, okay, screenwriting, I guess that's going to be the career I'm going to pursue. You know, how does that, do you, do you just move out to LA and start writing? Do you go to school for it? What was your, what was your journey to, in terms of practically getting to a point where you could have a career as a screenwriter? Well, mine was unique and I think unusual. And I, I got, I got lucky early. And I think in fact, it almost screwed me up forever. Um, to be honest, failing out of, I didn't fail out of my first job, but I failed enough that I didn't get hired back into the same system that I was in, which forced me to almost give up while still writing and weirdly led to the creation of Bill and Ted, which got me into the, with Chris Matheson, who, with whom I wrote all three Bill and Ted movies, which got the two of us into the, Lex, you know, into the ledgers, so to speak, of the map, you know. So what had happened for me was I was at UCLA. I was an economics major and I was writing jokes for comedians and I was doing stand up with a bunch of people who are still good friends of mine. A lot of screenwriters like Shane Black and Jim Hersfeld and Ryan Rowe. There was a lot of, you know, really talented folks in this environment. And of course, that's mutually challenging, you know, so you're both competing with and supporting and sharing and learning from Fred. Well, Fred Decker was a part of a group that was around, you know, you know, very close friends of, all, you know, and we, they were all interested in movies, a lot of my friends, and I didn't really know any differently. I think if I had, if I were starting again, I would actually go into theater novels and actually television where the writer is the sort of key element and where they're really either reading or saying the words you wrote, I probably wouldn't have gone into film, but it seemed like the high watermark at the time. I wasn't in any screenwriting classes because I wasn't a film major and I couldn't get into any screenwriting classes. So I took a bunch of playwriting classes. So it was really just the idea of making work constantly and getting out there constantly that is what got me that first job. That first job was a job on the TV show, Laverne and Shirley. And I was a senior at school, but the producer, I had been writing for Gary Shanling. And Gary introduced me to this producer named Mark Sakin. And Mark came to see a play I wrote at UCLA and hired me as a staff writer on the show. And I was okay. I wasn't great. I was okay. I wasn't good enough to get hired by Mark onto another show or hired by someone else onto a show. And had I, I think it would have burnt me out. I think I would have gotten involved in all the drugs people were doing in the eighties on those TV shows. I think I probably would have gotten into a TV writing mentality that I don't think would have been good for me by TV writing of like sitcom writing, eighties sitcom writing that I think would have fried me completely. And it was being forced to have to scramble that led me to go to Chris and say, hey, would you like to write something together? 
yeah, what would we write together? Well, we had been doing this improv group with no audience on purpose. We just meet Chris, Ryan Rowe, Mark Sandrowski, who is a television director, Mark Jaffe, who is a comedian and writer. We were just working out in a theater in Hollywood with no audience on, I think it was Monday night or whatever night they were dark for 20 bucks, we rented the theater. Mm -hmm. And we had come up with these characters, the Bill and Ted characters, but we just were playing around with them. We weren't trying to strip mine them to be in a movie, but we thought, well, if we're gonna write a movie, what would we write? And we thought, well, what if we put Bill and Ted into a movie? And then we started laughing and we wrote that. None of that would have happened had I not failed out of the, the Laverne and Shirley situation. So, you know, again, wouldn't have gotten it set up if I hadn't gotten fired by my agents when I turned in the Bill and Ted script. <laughs> they fired me. And they were sort of de facto representing Chris as well. They fired us both. We had no agents. And thankfully, I had there was an agent that I had met two years earlier when I got the Laverne and Shirley job named David Greenblatt. I called him and I'm like, hey, would you read a script? And he said, sure. We stayed in touch. He's the guy that got the thing set up and started our career. And weirdly for him, interestingly, if I'd said yes, then signed with him two years ago, I might not have still been with him. You know, who knows, right? Yeah. Again, it's like these missed connections and failures are actually the things that led to a kind of regeneration in a certain way. And then, you know, uh, speaking of that, eventually Steven somehow became involved with the third Bill and Ted movie. Yeah, because we'd worked, I'd loved working with them on Mosaic. I loved working with them. We, we were already working on No Sudden Move. You know, we'd been developing the script together. He was the one going, oh, I remember I was talking about it. I was saying, I was saying something like, we're 10 or 11 years into trying to get this thing made. He's like, what? And I said, we just can't get it made. No one seems to want to make it. Nobody seems to think it's commercial. Everyone who wants to do a Bill and Ted movie, they want to reboot it with like YouTube stars or, you know, yeah. TikTok stars. They don't have, like, they don't want to do what we want to do with it. And he's like, could I read it? And I said, sure. And he read it and he's like, okay, <laughs> this thing's got to get made. He, I said, do you want to be involved? He said, sure. He made some calls for us. He, you know, he, he was... It was great. I mean, he was a tactical weapon that we used. There you go. <laughs> fly. Got to fly. All right. <laughs> just for those of you listening, I just Call very back. impressively got a very, to be honest, very slow um, <laughs> um, in my hands. But um, so talking, he was a tactical weapon for us. He and he, he kind of, he was great on a bunch of levels. Made a few high level calls when we needed it. Didn't come to set at all. Didn't need him on set. I mean, Dean Pariso just, you know, was in charge and was great. Came in and did some editing and, you know, post-production feedback, um, get, you know, served as a buffer at times to the studio. He, he has final cut when he produces. So that means by de facto, it kind of goes to the director. I mean, it, there were a lot of great things about it. And I was so happy to be able to bring something to him that, uh, that was working out because, or that ended up working out because, you know, he was kind enough to bring this to me. I mean, it was him and Casey that, that brought No Sudden Move to me. They basically said, hey, we want to do this. Would you be interested? And that was the, probably the biggest compliment of my career. Yeah. You know, I think obviously the, the release of Bill and Ted wasn't what you guys expected, but the time at, at the time it came out, it, it brought me and a lot of people a lot of joy when, when it was sorely needed. So. I hope you guys are at least happy about that. You know, Phil, I really appreciate that beyond what you might imagine, because what was driving me on that movie to get that movie made were people that wanted to see it and my desire to not let them down. And I would say the pecking order in terms of who we were trying to please went ourselves me, Chris, Alex Keanu, and then Scott Kroof, the producer, and Dean, you know, when, when Dean came on, like, can we make a movie we're proud of? That was number one. That's why we wrote it on spec, even though we didn't own it. The, the, the characters, we wrote a spec script for, it was a, not a good business move, to be totally honest. In fact, it was a tremendously bad business move, not just in hindsight, but at the time. <laughs> but we wanted to get it, you know, Bill and Ted has never been a moneymaker for us. And we just wanted to get it creatively, to, you know, correct. So the first was like pleasing ourselves. And then it was like pleasing the people who really love Bill and Ted. And, you know, Bill and Ted is a, it can polarize, you know, there are people that just hate it and they're, but 
the people who, and there are people who could take it or leave it, of course, but unlike other things that I've been involved with, Bill and Ted has not a wide swath of fans, but a deep one. And I was like so desirous of giving them something that validated their desire to have that movie made because the movie would not have gotten made without the, without social media and without mm -hmm. finally enough people going, we would like to see that movie that it got us some investors. The district, the release of it was obviously a disappointment because it was in the middle of COVID of course. So it's mm -hmm. not like it played in a whole bunch of theaters, but at the same time, I kind of go, but it might've been the best way to see the movie given that more people by an exponential amount saw the movie in an aftermarket. I mean, it did fine in the theaters, but it not like it did a made, it made like $30 million. It's not like it was, you know, made 400 million. It was yeah. successful enough to get a sequel, but barely, but it grew over time, which is the thing that built this fan base. But it was also the thing, the reason it was tough to get financing was there were no numbers to support what we believed was the appetite for it in the public but we couldn't prove to people who crunch numbers. So it's a long way of saying that really means the world to me that you would say that. And yes. that was the whole intention. So thank you well, for that. Mission accomplished uh, as far as I'm concerned. Last question before I let you go. And you've dispensed a lot of wisdom, I'll say, you know, for, especially for writers out there. Is there anything that you, you know, learned along your very long career that you kind of wish you knew when you were first starting out that if you could go back and tell yourself something, this is the thing I wish I knew? <laughs> So many things and I'm going to, I'm not sure that this is the thing, but the first thing that comes to mind is trust my gut a little bit more in terms of what to do and not to do. I think if I'd said no to certain things and yes to others, I'd probably end up in the same place, you know, probably. I think I would, I would tell myself not to write, to be popular in the room, not to make changes that you don't believe in to, but to simply either solve your own anxiety created by the fact that you and the person quote above you don't see eye to eye mm -hmm. or you want them to like you. So you want to implement their idea. But I also would say to myself, don't be defensive. Don't get your ego involved and listen closely to what people are saying. Don't worry about, implementing their solutions but always listen to their problems so it's a it's it's i was erring on both sides of that line on the i was on the wrong i was on both wrong sides of the line i for the first half of my career for sure and that was i was both too defensive and if somebody rejected something even in just a gesture you know, I would be hurt and I would get defensive and I would become either angry or I would shoot back and defend myself, which, you know, was wrong. And I remember a producer once saying to me, well, you don't like something. You don't hide it very well, do you? And <laughs> I would have told myself, when you hear notes, never say no in the room, listen, go away. And, and once you've dealt with your own ego, sadness, disappointment, anxiety, really look at what those notes are and see what they're really saying and use it as an opportunity to take your script that exists now in whatever form it is and upgrade it. So I would tell myself to be less defended, but also to not write to please other people because what I've realized, and I think, you know, we, we much of many of us realize is people who give you notes, they don't want you to do their solutions. They just want, people want to be heard. They want to be perceived as being a colleague. They want to be treated as a professional in the same way that you want to be treated as a professional, which means don't patronize them and pretend to listen, but listen. Because if you've actually listened, they know that. And you can come back and say, hey, I heard what you had to say. And I did this and I did this, but I couldn't get this thing to work because of this and this. And most of the time people are like, okay, thank you for listening. But the other thing that happens all the time is you go, oh, I get what they were saying. And now I have a way to make it better. Mm -hmm. And once you release your own ego from it, like, oh, this is, you know, judgment on me or whatever, but rather go, okay, there, it's not working yet for whoever and, you know, for why ever, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
And once you release your impatient, the idea of being impatient, like I've got it, it's got to be done, it's got to be done, it's got to be done, but rather it will take whatever time it takes. And as long as I keep making it better, I'm going to stay at it. Mm -hmm. Once you release those things, it frees you up. And I wish I'd known that because I spent half of my career either overreacting in one way or the other. So that's probably what I what I would tell myself. I think that's a, an awesome note for people to hear. Ed, thank you so much for taking the time to chat and congrats on the film. Thank you, Phil. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. It really, yeah. and thanks for having your questions. Really appreciate it. Huge thanks to Ed Solomon for coming on the show. No Sudden Move is streaming on HBO Max right now. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you like this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Mm-hmm.